woman has been murdered. Police are sure of that. But nothing else is what it appears to be. Investigators must sort out who's the victim and who's the killer. A father's greeting cards are no cause for joy when his daughter suspects he's not the man he pretends to be. To find the truth, detectives follow a paper trail through a maze of lies. A bungled murder and a twist of fate tip investigators off to a killer's elaborate scheme. But to win a conviction, they'll need his cooperation. Taking a life, some killers take the phrase literally. After the kill, they assume their victims' lives, concealing their crime and hiding within their new stolen identity. To more than a million people, Detroit is Michigan's largest and toughest city. And like most metropolitan areas its size, it sees its share of crime. On May 4th, 1994, Betty Cole arrived at the Detroit Police Department to report her 32-year-old sister Annie missing. She said that Annie had left to run a quick errand with her boyfriend, Mo Jones, several hours earlier but hadn't returned. Jones was allegedly involved in drugs, and Betty was worried that something bad had happened to her sister. But police policy requires at least 24 hours before a missing persons investigation can be opened. Betty would have to wait. Why don't you go home? She's probably going to get asleep. Though upset, she returned home, hopeful that her sister would soon turn up. The following morning, an anonymous 911 call brought police to an abandoned warehouse. When they arrived, Betty Cole and members of her family were waiting outside. Betty had also received an anonymous call from a man who claimed that her sister Annie was inside. Officers made their way into the building. At the end of a corridor, they found the lifeless body of a young woman. She had been shot three times in the head. Police returned outside and asked Betty to identify the body. When she saw the victim, she broke down. She confirmed that it was her sister, Annie Cole. Forensics technicians began processing the scene. Near the body, they collected three spent small caliber shells. They also found a purse nearby, but it contained no cash, credit cards, or any form of identification. The bullets recovered from the victim were sent to the Detroit Forensic Services Lab. There, Sergeant Paul Hartzell analyzed the slugs and the recovered shell casings using a digital micrometer. The micrometer is a tool that we can use to help us determine caliber of a bullet or to help us uh, determine a probable make of a particular bullet. Uh, this is done by mounting the bullet either with the, uh, with the base up so we can measure the, the diameter of the bullet to help us determine caliber or we can actually measure the lands and grooves on the bullet to help us determine a probable make of a weapon that may have fired that bullet. 
Each brand of gun creates its own characteristic pattern on a slug. And every individual firearm leaves unique marks on a bullet, like the gun's fingerprint. Analysis of the markings on the three slugs recovered from the victim led examiners to conclude that it was one gun, a 22 caliber Smith & Wesson that had been used to commit the murder, indicating a lone trigger man. Sergeant Patrick Henahan of the Detroit Police Department began his investigation by looking for the last person reported to have been with Annie Cole, her yeah, boyfriend, Mo Jones. Of, uh, trying to identify him and find out where he might be. We weren't able to develop any information on a Mo Jones. Uh, we searched, you know, department arrest records, narcotics bureau records, things of that nature. We weren't able to come up with anything. While the search for the mysterious Mo Jones was underway, investigators tried to learn as much as they could about Annie Cole. The victim's fingerprints recovered from the crime scene were entered into the police database containing fingerprint records. After an extensive search, the database turned up no matches. Annie Cole had apparently stayed out of trouble until this terrible day. All you know is it's on pinpoint. Unable to locate the victim's boyfriend, Detective Hanahan relied on Betty Cole for information. But after a few days, it seemed she had disappeared. I made another attempt uh, after the weekend to, to contact her, and it was almost as if she had fallen off the face of the earth all of a sudden. Pat, why don't you take a look at this? With no clear leads in sight, he enlisted the aid of homicide detective Monica Childs. Her initial investigation revealed some troubling inconsistencies. Though the victim's prints were not on file with the police department, a records check revealed an extensive felony record under the name of Annie Cole. In fact, a warrant was currently out for her arrest on a probation violation. Trying to resolve the conflicting information, examiners compared the prints recovered at the crime scene with those contained in Annie Cole's criminal records. They didn't match. Annie Cole and the victim found at the warehouse were not the same person. And though there were several people named Annie Cole living in the Detroit metropolitan area, the victim and the known criminal shared a common address. Looking for answers, police went to the funeral home where the victim's body was being kept. Did you give me some information on the Cole case? There, the director stated that Betty Cole had been in four days earlier to request a speedy cremation for her sister. Betty had stressed that there wasn't to be a service. The cremation was scheduled for the following day. For Detective Monica Childs, the arrangements made no sense. Due to the age of the victim and me being an African American, I know culturally we have a service. Okay, if there's no body, we have a memorial service. Even if the person is cremated, there's a service. And Pat and I talked about it. He said, that doesn't sound right. That sounds a little odd. I said, that is very unusual. Uh, here's, uh, here's some of the crime scene. Investigators' strongest clue in this unusual case lay in a casket that was about to be incinerated. She doesn't have her shoes on, but the shoes are there. They obtained a court order to postpone the cremation. To sort things out, police needed to find Betty Cole, the woman who claimed to be the victim's sister. At the address Betty had given as her own, investigators were met by a man named James Shaver. He said he was Annie Cole's brother. He stated it was impossible that Annie had been murdered a week ago. He had just seen her the day before, leaving on a trip to Mississippi. And 
claimed he had never heard of Betty Cole. No, sir. No. No, sir. He agreed to accompany police to the funeral home to try to identify the body. Shaver viewed the body with a total lack of recognition. I'm, I don't know who this woman is. This is not my sister, though. This woman, whoever she was, was not his sister, Annie. If anyone could identify the nameless victim found in the warehouse, it was the fictitious Betty Cole, who was nowhere to be found. For investigators, it was clear that she was deeply involved in this deadly charade. Detroit police struggled to make sense of a bizarre murder investigation. Forensic evidence proved that the young female victim thought to be Annie Cole was misidentified, and the woman who had ID'd her was now missing. Hoping to give a name to the victim found shot to death in the warehouse, police scoured recent missing persons reports. One matched their victim. Quinetta and Roy Spruill had reported their 28-year-old niece, Stella, missing on May 4th, the day before the body was found. Stella's co-workers had called the Spruills looking for her. The employees said that when Stella left for lunch that day, she was going to meet someone, though she never said who. She seemed upbeat. But when Stella failed to return, they began to worry. The day after Stella's disappearance, a department store clerk called the Spruels looking for their niece. Stella had just applied for a credit card, and the store needed to verify some information on her application. The Spruels couldn't imagine that Stella would just take off without a word. Stella Spruel, from uh, what we learned from the family, was uh, a religious young lady, a loyal friend, just an all-around good person. Police asked the Spruels to view the body found at the warehouse, which had since been returned to the medical examiner's office. The victim was their niece, Stella Spruel. Now, police had to figure out who had murdered her and why. Detectives contacted the department store where Stella had allegedly filled out the credit card application. A surveillance camera had captured the transaction. Detectives recognized the woman in the video, and it wasn't Stella Spruel. It was the person who had identified herself as Betty Cole, the victim's sister, at the crime scene. Now, she was on tape impersonating Stella. And though investigators were convinced that the woman in the video was the real Annie Cole, they still had to determine how she was connected to Stella Spruel. Hoping to find an answer, they went to Stella's workplace. Employees there recognized the woman from the tape. Her name, they said, was Annie Cole. She used to work there with Stella, and the two were friends. For investigators, there was little doubt that Annie Cole was behind the murder of Stella Spruel. Now they needed proof. Police turned to Annie Cole's family for help. Annie's brother and one of her daughters were brought in for questioning. Police believed they might be able to identify the male voice on the anonymous 911 call that brought police to the warehouse where the victim's body was discovered. J. 
James Shaver didn't recognize the voice. But Annie Cole's daughter believed she did. While listening to the copy of the 911 tape, uh, the one daughter said, well, that's my cousin Leander. Annie Cole's 17-year-old nephew, Leander Foster, was brought in for questioning. Police recognized him as being with the fictitious Betty Cole at the warehouse when the body was discovered. Foster, who had no criminal record, broke down under questioning. Yes, me to help her out. Mm -hmm. He admitted that Annie had promised him and his best friend $5,000 each to kill Stella Spruill. The day before the murder, Annie arranged to meet Stella at a mall parking lot. Leander and his partner were nearby, getting a look at their intended victim. I mean, she, she showed us where she hangs out. The next she, day, when Stella her. arrived on her lunch hour to meet Annie again, Leander Foster and his friend were waiting. Oh, who are you? Oh, I'm, I'm Leander Foster. They abducted her at gunpoint, forced her inside the car, and took her to the abandoned warehouse. Right there. there, Foster said he shot her three times with a 22 caliber Smith & Wesson that Annie had given him for the job. They cleaned out her purse and gave Stella's ID to Annie. The next day, after Annie Cole filed the false missing persons report, Leander called the police to report the body. He didn't know what happened to the murder weapon. On May 11, 1994, a week after Stella Spruill was murdered, Annie Cole was tracked down at a relative's house in Indianola, Mississippi. She was arrested and taken back to Detroit for questioning. But police had already pieced together the motive behind Annie Cole's deadly scheme. Annie Cole was probably a consummate con person. She was aware of outstanding warrants for her arrest and made a calculated decision that she didn't want to go back to prison um, based on her interviews with co-defendants and witnesses. She set in place a plan to uh, uh, assume another person's identity um, and disappear into the sunset, if you will, um, and live happily ever after. To fake her own death, Annie needed a real victim. But she had no one in mind. The victim found her. Stella Spruill called her former co-worker to invite her to a makeup demonstration. Annie declined, but realized in that instant who her victim was going to be. Trusting, hard-working Stella Spruill. Annie Cole was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Leander Foster also received a life sentence. The other accomplice pled guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Some people kill to purify their reputations. Others are motivated by pure greed. Bonner County, Idaho lies nestled between Washington State to the west and Montana to the east. Here you go, Ted. But in 1994, oh, yes. it found itself in the middle of a mystery. In late February, Shelley Kepley right. arrived at the Bonner County Sheriff's Office. And everything seemed to be in order. What's his name? She had flown in from Reno, Nevada to check on her father, Paul Gruber, 
who lived in the area. She suspected that something was terribly wrong. Shelley said she'd last seen her father a month earlier when he'd come to Reno for the holidays. At age 54, he was independently wealthy as a result of good investments and had recently retired from teaching school. He'd been living in Idaho for about six months and seemed happy there. But over the past month or so, Shelley and her son had received several greeting cards and cash gifts from her father. But the signature on the cards didn't really look like his writing. And her repeated phone calls to him went unanswered. If he had gone on a trip, he would have told her his plans. Believing that someone may be impersonating her dad, Shelley didn't know where else to turn. Investigators forwarded the documents to the Idaho Department of Law Enforcement Crime Lab. There, examiners compared Gruber's known writing samples with the signatures on the greeting cards. But there wasn't enough to work with, and examiners could not exclude Paul Gruber as the person who signed the cards. Though police had no evidence of foul play, they agreed to look into the matter. Under the circumstances, Shelley had been given power of attorney over her father's estate. She gave police permission to search his property. Lieutenant Harvey Thompson went to Gruber's house to look around. Shelley had told him that her father kept his financial records and an inventory of his possessions in a locked box hidden in the crawl space. Lieutenant Thompson went there to recover it. Uh, there was an inventory in it. There were titles to vehicles in it. Uh, there was a little bit of jewelry in it and uh, insurance papers. With the inventory now in hand, Investigators made their way through the house. Empty. Plastic sheets covering the furniture suggested that Gruber had gone away for an extended period of time. It soon became apparent that several items on the list were nowhere to be found. And they were not the type of things one packs simply to go on a trip. I found out about guns being missing. I found out uh, uh, a computer equipment that should have been there was gone. Uh, a, a gun safe was gone. Just uh, a lot of stuff was gone. It seems Shelley Kepley's concerns about her missing father were well founded. And though there was no physical evidence to support it, police were now starting to believe that harm had come to Paul Gruber. Police in Bonner County, Idaho, continued searching for clues in the mysterious disappearance of 54-year-old Paul Gruber. And though no one had heard from him in some time, his accounts were still active. While scouring financial records obtained from Gruber's bank, Lieutenant Thompson found something suspicious. Paul Gruber had been paying someone else's mortgage. And from what police had learned, that seemed completely out of character. From talking to Shelley Kepley, Mr. Gruber's daughter, Mr. Gruber didn't pay other people's mortgages. He didn't loan other people his vehicles. You know, what's Mr. Gruber's pretty well stays Mr. Gruber's. Daryl Kuehl, the man whose mortgage was being paid for by Gruber, was brought in for questioning. He told police he was a general contractor who had done extensive work at Gruber's house. He said he was starting a new home security business and other ventures that Paul Gruber had decided to invest in. Rather than investing cash, however, Gruber had agreed to make payments to Kuehl's mortgage company. 
To investigators, that arrangement didn't sound like something Shelley Kepley's father would agree to. To be certain they were talking about the same person, police showed Kuehl a photograph of Paul Gruber. But Kuehl didn't recognize him. That wasn't the man he knew. Someone else, it seemed, was trying to pass himself off as Paul Gruber. Investigators asked him to describe the man who hired him to a police sketch artist. If police were to have any hope of finding the missing Paul Gruber, they would first have to identify the imposter. Armed with the sketch, police canvassed Gruber's neighborhood. But nobody recognized the face. And no one had seen Gruber for some time. As the race to put a name to the face in the sketch intensified, investigators got a break. The manager of the local post office had heard of the disappearance and informed police that Paul Gruber's mail was still being picked up from his P.O. box. Yeah, sure. Listen, do me a favor. He turned over a tape from a security camera that was located near Gruber's box. The video revealed three men at different times in the vicinity of Gruber's P.O. box. One of them, partially obscured and in profile, looked familiar. One of the males that was at Mr. Gruber's box during the period of time uh, appeared to be that of uh, Daryl Kuehl. Suddenly, the investigation's best witness was becoming the prime suspect. Though the image on the video was not conclusive, it was enough for investigators to obtain a warrant to search Kuehl's property. Inside his home, they found a variety of tools, electronic equipment, and other items that were similar to those missing from Paul Gruber's residence. Daryl Kuehl insisted the things belonged to him. But detectives discovered that some of the items had serial numbers matching the inventory from Gruber's safe. Though police suspected Kuehl had killed Gruber and then assumed his identity in order to cash in on his victim's wealth, they found nothing to support a murder charge. I had enough probable cause to arrest him for uh, maybe theft and uh, possibly forgery, uh, but we didn't have a body. I couldn't prove that uh, anything had actually happened to Mr. Gruber. Feeling something may have been overlooked, Lieutenant Thompson ordered another search of Gruber's home. One of the investigators had found a strange depression in the crawl space and the excavation team began digging beneath the house. They kept at it for hours, but with no luck. Then, about two feet down, they were overcome by the unmistakable smell of a decomposing body. Police in northern Idaho were getting closer to solving the mysterious disappearance of 54-year-old Paul Gruber. Digging in the crawl space of Gruber's home, police believed they had finally found him. We went under the house and about two and a half feet down found a uh, white plastic trash bag, took it out and found several pairs of glasses and glass case in it. Also a distinct odor of a uh, deteriorating body. 17 months after being reported missing by his daughter, Paul Gruber's body was found, wrapped in an air mattress and buried beneath his own house. 
He had been shot six times. Police theorized that Paul Gruber had been killed in order to clear the way for someone to steal his identity and access his wealth. Investigators believe that someone was Daryl Kuehl. Now they had to prove it. And the best way to do that was to physically link him to the scheme to steal Gruber's identity. The greeting cards that Gruber's daughter received, allegedly from her father, were sent to the lab for DNA analysis. Examiners removed the stamps from the envelopes, hoping to find DNA from the person who mailed them. But according to Carla Finnis of the Idaho Department of Law Enforcement Crime Lab, finding usable DNA samples on the back of a stamp was a long shot. When you're talking about a stamp or an envelope, the cellular material comes from cells that have been sloughed off into the saliva from the cheeks and the tongue of the individual who licks the stamp or envelope. Uh, one can imagine that that's considerably less DNA than one would find in a normal blood sample. Still, examiners were able to isolate and extract a single minute trace of saliva. The sample was enough for a DNA profile to be developed. Now, they needed a source of comparison. Despite his protestations of innocence, Daryl Kuehl was arrested for suspicion of murdering Paul Gruber. Once in custody, police wasted no time obtaining a blood sample. The evidence was sent back to the crime lab. Examiners generated a DNA profile of Daryl Kuehl. The results were then compared to the profile generated from the stamp. The conclusion was indisputable. Daryl Kuehl had licked those stamps. Police had made their case. From what investigators could determine, Kuehl had a history of shady business schemes. He saw his employer, the wealthy, retired Paul Gruber, as an easy mark. But Gruber must have seen through the scams, refusing to be taken in. Kuehl then came up with another plan to get to his money. He would become Paul Gruber. Daryl Kuehl was found guilty of first-degree murder, grand theft, and forgery. He received 25 years for murder and 25 years for theft. A daughter's diligence made it hard for Kuehl to maintain his charade. But some predators rely on the vulnerability and isolation of their victims to work their schemes. On August 15, 1997, state police were dispatched to the home of 56-year-old Thomas Wayne Jones in Milford, Delaware. When Jones's home care nurse arrived for work, she found traces of blood on the floor. The house had been ransacked. Valuable coins and several financial records appeared to be missing. Her employer, who was confined to a wheelchair, was nowhere to be found. Outside, police combed the grounds for any clues to Jones's whereabouts. One of the officers followed faint tire tracks that disappeared into a field. They led him 500 yards from the house and directly to the body of Thomas Wayne Jones. He had been shot in the back of the neck, but was still alive. Emergency personnel rushed to the scene. 
The wealthy entrepreneur was in critical condition, but still conscious. He managed to tell police the identity of his attacker, a longtime friend named George Calamaris. Jones said that after being shot, Calamaris placed him in a white pickup truck and dumped him in the field. A warrant was issued for Calamaris' arrest. Records indicated that Calamaris was living across the Delaware border in Silver Spring, Maryland. There, officers from the Montgomery County Police Department were asked to bring in the suspect in the shooting of Thomas Wayne Jones. But when police went to pick Calamaris up, he wasn't home. Calamaris' wife, Noreen, stated that she had not heard from her husband in a few days. But she agreed to contact the police if and when she heard from him. Police were skeptical that Calamaris' wife would actually turn him in. But a few hours later, Montgomery County Detective Terry Ryan received a call. Mrs. Calamaris notified the police once she was contacted by George Calamaris. He was living in a, a wooded area, um, <clears throat> essentially on the lam, uh, close to the home, and he contacted her uh, in an effort to get some money and clothing. Mrs. Calamaris told police that her husband was on his way to a nearby convenience store to buy supplies. When he exited the store, police were waiting. They moved in and made the arrest. He was transported to the Maryland Detention Center and booked for the attempted murder of Thomas Wayne Jones. Calamaris admitted he was friends with Jones. Having recently returned to the area after living in North Carolina, Calamaris had gone to visit Jones that morning. He strongly denied any knowledge of the attack. Though investigators suspected that Calamaris was lying, they had no obvious motive and no hard evidence linking him to the crime. John, Believing Calamaris's truck used to transport the victim into the field would yield valuable clues, police spent the next few months trying to track it down. But its whereabouts remained unknown. Then they got a tip. An anonymous caller told police that the pickup truck could be found at a machine shop in nearby Dickerson, Maryland, owned by one of Calamaris's friends. But when they arrived, investigators saw no sign of the truck. The shop owner denied any knowledge of the vehicle, though he admitted he was friends with George Calamaris. The lead appeared to be a waste of time until a bundle of mail caught the detective's eye. The name on the letters bore a striking similarity to the name of the shooting victim in Delaware. It was several pieces of mail uh, from a bank in North Carolina addressed to a person named Gary Wayne Thomas. Uh, we knew that this similarity in names, our, our Delaware victim, Thomas Wayne Jones, uh, was probably more than a a coincidence. In fact, we at the point we expected it was probably uh, some alias that Calamaris had contrived from the uh, the Jones case. The shop owner claimed that he didn't know who Gary Wayne Thomas was. He said Thomas's mail arrived there, and George Calamaris picked it up. And now that Calamaris was in prison, awaiting extradition to Delaware, his wife collected it. Unsure if this clue was related to the shooting of Thomas Wayne Jones in Delaware, Montgomery County Detective Joe Mandano contacted the North Carolina bank 
to see if there really was a client by the name of Gary Wayne Thomas. They said, yes, there was. And I said, well, can you describe them to me? And I fully expected them to describe the way George Calamaris looks. And they describe somebody completely different. And I asked, well, when is the last time you saw Gary Wayne Thomas? And the bank said, well, come to think of it, probably 1996, the middle of 96. And this was over a year later. According to bank records, Gary Wayne Thomas was worth millions. And no one had seen him in over a year. You know, see the continue. As police struggled to figure out the connection, word came in that Thomas Wayne Jones died as a result of his injuries from the shooting attack. Now, police shifted their focus to building a murder case against their suspect, George Calamaris. While police struggled to link George Calamaris to the murder of Thomas Wayne Jones in Delaware, their investigation uncovered a strange clue. Calamaris was receiving mail from a bank in North Carolina for a man named Gary Wayne Thomas. Unsure who this person was or how he was connected to George Calamaris, authorities contacted police in North Carolina. Detective Ricky Best of the Greenville Police Department was asked to pursue the lead. They were asking me to check at a certain location here in Greenville um, to try to locate Gary Wayne Thomas. Um, that they, had, um, they were investigating a murder case themselves and they wanted to find out if Gary Wayne Thomas existed. Detective Best began by speaking to the manager of the bank where the letters to Gary Wayne Thomas originated. She confirmed that Thomas was indeed a real person, and he was living off the interest of a trust fund worth more than a million dollars. His account was still active, and money was being withdrawn regularly. But over the past year, he communicated solely through letters and rare phone calls. Looking for answers, Greenville police contacted Thomas's family, his father confirmed that he had set up the trust fund for his son. He said Gary was a troubled young man who battled drug and alcohol dependency. Worried about his son's well-being, he instructed the family attorney to draw up the trust. He hoped the fund would limit the amount of money Gary could access to purchase drugs and alcohol. But the arrangement had caused friction, and Mr. Thomas had little contact with Gary after that. In fact, he hadn't heard from his son in over a year. The information put investigators no closer to establishing the connection between Gary Wayne Thomas and George Calamaris. They needed to find Thomas. Hoping to track him down, police contacted the apartment manager of his last known address. She said that Gary Wayne Thomas disappeared sometime around June or the first part of July of 1996. That she thought it to be odd because he left all of his belongings there in the apartment. But one of Gary's friends, um, she referred to him as George Calamaris, told her that Gary was away in Maryland Police had established that George Calamaris and Gary Wayne Thomas had lived in the same apartment complex in North Carolina and were friends. Now, the wealthy Gary Wayne Thomas was missing. The information was passed on to the Maryland detectives. Police now feared that Gary Wayne Thomas had met the same fate as Thomas Wayne Jones in Delaware, that he had been murdered in an attempt to get at his money. 
but they had no proof that anything had actually happened to Gary Wayne Thomas. In fact, money was still being withdrawn from Thomas's account through a bank in Silver Spring, Maryland. But it couldn't be Calamaris making the withdrawals. He was in prison. Well, we asked the bank to please keep the account open. Don't close it. Allow the withdrawals to continue so we could start tracing them. And when we did that, we immediately, from the codes, from the transaction codes, we could find out what bank the money was being withdrawn for from in Maryland, obtained the bank film, and the first film we obtained, the person obtaining the money was Noreen Calamaris, George's wife. Noreen Calamaris, who had been cooperative since early in the investigation, was arrested for bank fraud and money laundering. A subsequent search of the Calamaris home uncovered Gary Wayne Thomas's ATM card and some unmailed letters allegedly signed by him asking his bank to increase his monthly allowance. Noreen told police that after her husband was arrested, their friend at the machine shop started bringing over Thomas's mail. It included bank statements, the ATM card, and blank checks. She said that her husband told her that Thomas had given them permission to use the items. Noreen hadn't seen or heard from Thomas since she left North Carolina with George Calamaris several months earlier. The information prompted investigators to search Calamaris's jail cell. Several typewritten letters ready to be mailed to the bank in North Carolina, signed Gary Wayne Thomas, were confiscated. Because the U.S. mail was being used to perpetuate the crimes, the evidence was forwarded to the U.S. Postal Inspection Service Crime Lab in New York. There, forensic sciences manager John Schatz compared handwriting from the documents found in Calamaris's house and jail cell against known samples of Gary Wayne Thomas. We know that we never write exactly the same way. If we have writings that is exactly the same, it's usually an indication that it is a, a trace forgery or another type of uh, photocopy that has been reproduced and uh, document has been altered. But in many cases, what we do is we compare the, the idiosyncratic movement, we make a comparison of the similar motions and dissimilar motions, and then we become a determination if they're written by the same author. Besides the shape and slant of the letters, analysts also look for the pressure on the page and places where a forger paused to consciously form his letters a certain way. These pen lifts can be a tip-off to a forgery. When we made those comparisons, we were able to determine that Mr. Calamaris was the author of the Gary Thomas signatures on the typewritten letters. Unable to dodge the evidence, Calamaris knew his run was over. To avoid the death penalty, he confessed to his crimes. He told investigators that he had been friends with Gary Wayne Thomas, but soon became jealous of his wealth. He plotted to kill him and take over his life, or at least his trust fund. In July 1996, Calamaris offered to show Thomas some marijuana plants he said he was growing in a field near the apartments. But when they drove out there, Calamaris shot Thomas dead. He left him in the woods, then later returned to scatter the remains so they would never be found. The crime went undetected for almost three years. Financially, 
It had worked out well for Calamaris, but it wasn't enough. Soon after returning to Maryland, he began devising another scheme. He would kill his friend, Thomas Wayne Jones, assume his identity, and cash in on his victim's wealth. The plan backfired, however, when Jones lived long enough to identify his attacker. For his crimes, George Calamaris received 395 years for the federal crime of bank fraud, life in prison for the murder of Thomas Wayne Jones, and 45 years for the murder of Gary Wayne Thomas. Noreen Calamaris received six months of house arrest for money laundering and mail fraud. For some murderers, taking a life is not enough. They want to become their victims. The result is an ongoing deception that's difficult to maintain. Each day increases the chances that a killer will be exposed, hiding behind a stolen identity.